Kia ora koutou and welcome to tonight's Goodfellow Unit webinar on identifying and treating SCC and BCC. My name is Dr Courtney White and tonight we'll hear from Dr AJ Sine, a dermatologist who is trained in the Waikato, Auckland and Brisbane, Australia. He has extensive experience in cosmetic dermatology, the use of lasers in dermatology and is currently finishing a Mohs Micrographic Surgery Fellowship in Tauranga. I will now hand over to AJ. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, good evening, everybody. What we're going to talk about tonight, you know, I spend a good portion of my time dealing with skin cancer, um, the vast majority of BCC and SCC. So I'm not going to be talking so much about the clinical identification of these or the dermoscopic appearance of these. It's rather how do we treat them and, and how do we go about identifying you know, what's the right step when you're faced with one of these lesions in front of you that you suspect is a skin cancer? What should you be doing with it to make sure that you're treating it properly um, and that you're not doing your patient a disservice by doing the wrong treatment and then having a nasty recurrent tumor down the line. So we'll run through it step by step. So why, why am I giving this talk? Well, you know, in my, I've been doing this most fellowship now for two years um, and I've done dermatology now for six. And, you know, in that time, I've heard a lot of things, um, you know, patients and various colleagues around things like, you know, oh, why do you bother, you know, a squamous cell carcinoma and BCC, they're not that dangerous, they're just skin cancer. Um, I've also heard people going, well, look, let's just try this cream on it and see what happens. Or look, I can give that a light freeze with a liquid nitrogen and that should deal with it. And if it doesn't, we can always do it again. Um, or actually, oh, you know, this one's on your face and I don't want to take too much skin. So we're just going to keep it quite narrow. And, you know, that way I'm not going to cause any problems with scarring. So, you know, these are kind of the ways that need to try and adjust the way of thinking so that we're, when treating things appropriately, um, because otherwise you do get incompletely excited, you get recurrent tumors and you're actually creating more work for yourself, for the patient, and you, you're potentially causing um, increased morbidity and mortality for these people because his CCs can metastasize as can BCCs. Uh, so they're not as innocuous as what you might be thinking. So here's the issue highlighted. Um, these two chaps here, so this one on the left and then the one on the top right, they're both the same patient. He's a war veteran. Um, so all of these lesions circled on his back are recurrent superficial BCCs. He's obviously had a number of excisions. He's had a lot of skin cancer over his time. Um, he was under a dermatologist for many years and then fell off for whatever reason, was seeing his GP, who then passed him on to his practice nurse. And, you know, when he came in to see me for the first time, and this is when we identified all of these, he said, oh, you know, the nurse just used to come in and say, look, I don't really know what I should be doing, but let's just use some of the liquid nitrogen and treat them. Um, you tell me what I should do, and because you've had this done lots of times before. And we ended up in this mess, all right? Um, unfortunately, he's now got metastatic bowel cancer, so we're not dealing with any of these. He's got other problems. But when I first saw him, um, we were going to have to start chipping away at a large number of um, BCCs. Um, and whilst it's in the public, whilst it's in private, he doesn't have insurance, it was all going through the veteran affairs, um, which is all tax dollars at work. So, you know, the health cost behind this was massive. Um, he also had this lesion on his nose. This is the line. The line there is the scar in the middle from two previous excisions done in public. Uh, and what I've highlighted here was the BCC that was incompletely excised both times. He's got another BCC on the side of his nasal sidewall. We'll come back to him later um, for his right temple. This lady down the bottom right here, those two scaly plaques, you might look at it and go, oh, it's just a bit of sun damage. Actually, those two lesions were uh, fairly decent squamous cell carcinomas. Um, that ended up as a decent sized hole once we cleared it using most surgery that had been treated about three times with Effidix and unsurprisingly came back every time, got worse every time uh, and left it with a big hole. So, you know, these are highlighting why I want to give this talk um, and just chatting about how we manage these things to try and avoid these situations. So what are we going to talk about? Well, look, we'll talk about ECC and SCC in situ, BCC and its subtypes, why I love biopsies, topical treatments, how do you choose them, which one's the right one, how do we use them, when is surgery the right option, and then what are some of the other options out there? So squamous cell carcinoma in situ, SCCIS, um, Bowen's disease, um, intraepidermal carcinoma, all names for the same beast. So it is a low risk cancer. You know, these guys are superficial in nature. They're not invading down through the basement membrane. Um, they always pretty much occur within an area of actinic damage. So it's a stepwise progression with these. We get a lot of actinic field change within that you'll start to get some cells that are growing more abnormally than others and will start having a clonal um, proliferation. They'll become the squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And if left long enough, these things do eventually, not all of them, but do eventually um, evolve into a squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see with this chap, 
This biopsy was done here. This whole scaly plaque was an SCC in situ, but he's got significant pink scaly plaques around, and that's all actinic field damage. So this is occurring within a field that's seen a lot of sun. And indeed, you know, squamous cell carcinoma, SCCAS and AK are all to do with sun exposure. So there are options available for squamous cell carcinoma, but there are caveats to that that I'll touch on later that you need to be considering. Squamous cell carcinoma, you know, I think if you saw this one on the ear or on the hand, you'd have a fair idea of what was going on here. Um, but this gentleman in the top right, we see him every three months. He sprouts skin cancer like uh, people grow weeds in their garden. Um, I see him a lot. So, you know, he had these two lesions on his forehead that clinically look very similar. This one, though, on the left is not the squamous cell carcinoma. That one there is the actinic, keratop uh, actinic keratosis. Nothing more concerning than that. This one on the right was the squamous cell carcinoma. So, you know, within these areas, it's sometimes hard to see the wood for the trees and it can be tricky. Um, you know, SCCs are the second most common skin cancer uh, after BCCs. And these guys, if left unchecked, these are the ones that will crawl along nerves, spread along lymphatics, end up metastatic, um, and patients can die from it. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not uncommon that we're getting very advanced recurrently treated squamous cell carcinomas, um, and they do cause big issues. But not all SCCs are created equally. You know, they've got high risk features behind them. So if they're poorly differentiated, if they're a big tumor, and that's dependent on body site, um, you know, anything over two centimeters below the neck is a high risk tumor. <clears throat> any, technically any SCC on the face, particularly the central face, no matter the size is a high risk tumor. Um, because of all the nerves and the close proximity uh, back to the brain as they crawl along nerves. Perineural invasion, so that's what this photo is indicating. So you've got a nerve in the middle here, and around that, this horrible looking thing here is the SCC that's tracking within the nerve sheath. Um, so that's perineural invasion. This is a small diameter nerve, so it's not as much of a risk, and you make sure it's all clear. But when we're seeing this, we start thinking this is a very nasty tumor. The other thing that's important, just like in melanoma, is the Breslow thickness. So how thick through the skin is it going? Um, and that has correlations with predicting outcome uh, and survival rates with these things. So to illustrate, you know, well differentiated versus poorly differentiated. Um, so you've got here on the left upper eyelid, you've got a well-defined papule. That was a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. What do I mean by that? Well, the cells are cancerous. It is a skin cancer, but it's still trying to keratinize. You know, you might get these keratin horns overlying this thick keratin, um, and it's forming these keratin pearls and whorls as it's trying to do what it should be doing in forming skin, just doing it badly. You compare that to a poorly differentiated SCC, which was just this indurated red plaque, no real keratin overlying, not scaly, um, had just been a bit tender for her, but otherwise hard to know where it started and stopped. This is a poorly differentiated SCC, and you can see that here, not really keratinizing. Um, and it's just a complete mess. Uh, these guys on the right are far more aggressive than the guys on the left. Um, and it's the poorly differentiated ones that have a, a um, worse outcome than the well differentiated. Moving on to basal cell carcinoma. Um, so like I said, the most common form of skin cancer. And they come in a huge variety um, of sizes, of clinical appearance. I mean, they also have a large number um, of subtypes and I'll show some of the types type, subtypes today, but um, by no means is it a comprehensive list. You know, so on the tip of the nose, that's a nodular BCC. Um, if that walked in and you looked at it, you'd probably go, hmm, something's not right there. Um, you know, at least send it to someone that knows. But you know, this one that I found on this man's right chin, tiny, yeah. Um, that was a superficial BCC. We treated that, we cleared it. Um, and he's now happy, I hope. Um, so if we're looking at the histology behind these things, the most common histological subtype is a nodular BCC, which is up here at the top left well-defined large islands of tumor um, that don't really, you know, they are invasive and in that it's a BCC, but they're well encapsulated. You know, you can draw exactly where the cancer starts and stops. Superficial BCC here on the right is also very common right up there with nodular. And this is a superficial BCC is one that is not invading down deeper. So it's part of the epidermis, hasn't gone through the basement membrane, but can crawl down um, at nixal structures. So here's one that's going down a hair follicle towards the spacious glands. Um, and I'll show some photos of that. And this is important when we start talking about topical treatment, when we're looking at the recurrence rate and success rates of treating these superficial cancers. This guy down the bottom left is a micronodular BCC. So just these little islands, they're a nastier subtype. Um, this one is particularly nasty. So this is an infiltrative BCC as is the one on the right. Um, so you can't make it out too well there, but you know, you've got these little tiny dots and strands of 
um, cancer that are invading through. And if you look, you know, in this region here, you've lost your adnexal structures where the cancer is invading, whereas you've got your normal hair follicles and sebaceous glands here. They start to disappear here because the cancer is invading and taking it over. Same on this side here, you know, these dark purple bits are all the islands of tumor that are invading down. So these can be nasty. They like to send off little strands um, and you've got to make sure you're clearing it. This is every dermatologist's worst nightmare. Every most surgeon's worst nightmare. This is a sclerosing or morphic BCC. Islands of tumor, sometimes even just little individual cells, all encased within scar. So for some reason, it induces what's known as a stromal response and you get collagen being laid down between this and it forms a scar and clinically these things can look really indistinct. Often it's just this sort of shiny white atrophic but a bit thick area, maybe some subtle telangic tasia in it. Um, they can be really nasty and often because they're so subtle clinically, they're quite advanced by the time we come to treat them um, and then we've got to get them clear. So you know these tumors when we start diagnosing morphic BCC, um, often they're bigger deals to deal with. <clears throat> so the importance of biopsy, why do I Care so much about biopsy. I mean, you know, I've been doing derm for six years. Surely I can identify these things and treat them. The fact is that, you know, clinically, yes, there is bound or stuff that you can identify. But when you start getting crusty old guys like this, who we see a lot of, you know, your farmers, anybody who spent any decent amount of time in the sun, builders, anybody else, they end up with a lot of actinic damage. And it's really hard to know, you know, what's what, what do we need to deal with? What can we leave? And doing a biopsy helps you determine. So, you know, within these two areas, this guy's got two lesions that clinically look very similar. This one was an SCC, this one was a BCC. All of this in between was actinic damage. Um, and we cleared both tumors for him. So, you know, when I'm starting to look at things, I've got a high index of suspicion. If I can feel in duration, if a patient says, oh, this bleeds really easily, if they say that point is really tender, um, you know, and the rest of the scaly bits aren't, you got to start thinking maybe there's something else there. Sure, it could just be an inflamed actinic keratosis or an inflamed hypertrophic actinic keratosis, which can mimic an SCC. Uh, but you need to be biopsying these things. Not only that, but the biopsy is what is going to dictate your appropriate treatment. So whether you're going to send this person, whether you're going to trial topical treatment, whether you're going to send them straight for surgery, you need to know what you're treating. It removes the guesswork. And these things are not you know, cancers like any other cancer that you want to have any guesswork with. It's not just a let's try this and see what happens type of exercise. And really, you know, there aren't any excuses to do um, a biopsy. You know, there's no way that I can't get to with a three more punch biopsy. Yes, if it's up on an eyelid and you're worried, okay, fine, send it to someone who can do it. Um, but, you know, tips of noses, do a three more punch biopsy. There's no, the worst you're going to do is hit a little bit of cartilage. You'll lift that bit of skin out. You won't take the cartilage with you. It'll stay behind. You'll close the hole up. It'll be a three millimeter scar. There's no excuse really not to be doing biopsies wherever possible. And we biopsy day in, day out. Every time we do a skin check, you know, if the biopsy needs to be done, the nurse is in, they're doing it for us straight after. Um, and just on a side note, there is no evidence that uh, local with adrenaline causes problems unless you're doing a ring block, in which case we don't really do it around a finger. But otherwise, I inject um, tips of fingers, tips of toes, tips of noses, penises with um, local with adrenaline, and I've never had anything fall off before. Um, and indeed, that's the clinical experience here with Paul Salmon, who's been doing it 20 odd years. Neil Mortimer is doing it almost 20 years. Um, they've never had anything necrose because they use local with adrenaline. So feel free to use it anywhere. It helps with your bleeding. What you do is you inject it, let the adrenaline sit there for, you know, five, 10 minutes where you go right up your note and then come back into your biopsy and you'll find it'll be a, a lot less blood to deal with. Tips and nose is still a pain in the ass, but um, less blood, hopefully. So once you've done your biopsy and you've got your biopsy report back that shows what you're dealing with, well, now you can start thinking about the right way to treat these lesions. So some things you need to be thinking about. What does the biopsy show? What location is it in? Because that's going to dictate what your treatment's going to be. For example, the superficial basal cell carcinoma below the knee confirmed on biopsy only has about a 50% response rate to topical treatment with a micromod, um, even worse with 5-fluorouracil with Effudex. Uh, and if you go and freeze it properly, like I'm going to tell you to freeze skin cancer, you're going to cause a big ulcer that's going to take three to six months to heal. So for a superficial BCC below the knee, I cut them out because they heal faster and you know that you've dealt with the tumor. So that's what I'm talking about. You need to be thinking about the location. If you've got something right by the eye, you might not go and use Effudex. What's the patient's ability to tolerate the treatment? Have they had very pronounced responses to topical treatment before and they want to shy away from it? 
you know, I had a lady today who was given um, Ifidex to treat an SCCIS on her forehead. After three days, awful response, stopped using it. Her tumor went away, but she was really unhappy. She never wants to use it again. So you've got to be thinking about that. You know, are they able to reach that superficial BCC right in the middle of their back with a Mikkelmod, Eldara? More, no. So you need to think about something else. So, you know, you've always got to be thinking about those things. And what's your patient's expectations? You know, if you're going to freeze something, you're going to cause a white scar. If you've frozen a skin cancer properly, you will always leave behind a hypopigmented scar. You cannot avoid it. Um, so if you're doing that on the face, don't do it, right? Because no one's going to thank you. If you've got, I find it particularly more in younger, even slightly older women, um, if you're going to be freezing something in a visible spot like the decolletage, they're never going to like it. So I will go and cut them out because I know that aesthetically I can get a better result with a straight line scar than I can leaving a white mark where I've frozen it. So that's all these things you've got to be thinking about before you start talking about topical treatment. Keep in mind as well that Himikomod or Aldara um, can leave behind a hypopigmented scar um, as part of its treatment. No one knows why, but it can do it. And that, that white doesn't really change. So you've always got to warn your patient and document that you've warned them about that. Um, because if it happens, then you can't really reverse it. So they need to be comfortable with that. Something to keep in mind. Ephidex doesn't do it, but Aldara can. So just a quick note on actinic field damage. I stole this photo off Dermnet, <clears throat> but you can see, you know, there's widespread actinic damage. Why will I go and treat actinic field damage? Well, you know, sometimes it's a case of being able to see through the, you know, seeing the woods for the trees, right? Because if there's so much damage in the background there, well, maybe there is a skin cancer sitting in there that you're just not seeing and just not feeling comfortable to identify because there's so much background noise. So then you might do field treatment. Okay, so in someone like this, I will never use cryotherapy because what's the point? You're going to treat one, two, three, 10, 20 lesions and leave them still with 100. And those are going to flare back up. Plus you run the risk of leaving a little white mark if you use it and you're not going to get anywhere. Someone like that needs field treatment. Cryotherapy for the localized tender actinic keratosis that's really bothering them, that's fine. As long as you know what you're doing and you're careful with it, by all means go for gold. But for field damage, you need to be using a field treatment. What I use is 5-fluorouracil Ephidex with calcipatrile Divinex. Now, the annoying thing is that Ephidex comes in a 20-gram tube, whereas Divinex comes in this massive 120-gram tube. So you've got to warn your patients about that because they feel like they should use equal amounts of both. Um, but it's all funded. The evidence is that for field damage, Ephidex with Divinex in combination, so an equal-sized amount of each, if I'm treating you know, temples, forehead, which I'll always break the face up into three and treat a third at a time. Um, temples and forehead, they'll use half a pea-sized amount of each. Smear that right across like a moisturizer, not dotting it on the individual spots, right across, because you need to pick up all of that area. It'll only pick up the sun damage on normal skin. It's like a moisturizer, it does nothing. It'll light up like a Christmas tree. You want them to get red, tender, and eroded, right? Not ulcerated and miserable, but eroded. They need to be a bit broken down and weepy if you're going to affect any reasonable change. Um, you know, the nice thing about using calcipatrile is that it stimulates something known as thymic stromal lymphopoietin. So it's stimulating the immune response um, and enhancing the effects of the 5 fluorouracil. So you can really reduce the amount of time you have to use the Evidex by about half. So if I'm going to treat actinic damage just with Ephidex on the face, they do it twice a day for two to three weeks. If they're doing combination Ephidex and Divinex, they do it twice a day for um, seven to 10 days. So really cutting things down, that's on the face. If it's off the face or on, if it's on the scalp or the rest of the body, then they're doing it uh, twice a day for two to three weeks, as opposed to the four to six weeks that you do Ephidex by itself. So, you know, it is sometimes worth doing. But keeping in mind, though, that if there's nothing that's making you too suspicious and is not bothering the patient, you don't have to force this on them. Um, you're not necessarily going to reduce their cancer risk long term by treating the background damage. And this stuff, like I said, is low risk stuff, right? Less than one in a thousand become a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so if they don't really feel like feeling spotty that year, that's OK. You don't have to make them look like a leper. So what are the options? So, you know, there is one cream for squamous cell carcinoma in situ, and there is one cream for superficial BCC, and they don't get mixed. One is for one, one is for the other. And that is their license for use, and that is what needs to be done. Ephidex, 5 fluorouracil is for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. It is not for superficial BCC. The evidence around this, you get about a 70% 12-month clearance using Ephidex. Compare that to about half if you're using a Mikomod. 
And PDT comes in last. We don't use it here at the clinic because it is rubbish. Um, you charge a fortune for it, but it is rubbish. Um, the evidence around it is that it does not actually treat squamous cell carcinoma in situ as well as Effidix does. And Effidix is funded. So why wouldn't you use the better, cheaper treatment? Um, and it's even worse than a micromod. So I never use PDT. We used to until the evidence started coming out that it's rubbish. Uh, that includes for field treatment. Um, it doesn't work as well as what a combination Effidix and calcium trial does. So if you've got an SCC inside you, that's what you need to be using. Twice a day for four weeks to the face, six weeks to the body. It gets red and tender. If they get really red and tender and it's like tender and weepy and they're at two weeks, take a break. Let it settle down over three to four days. Include that in your four weeks total and then pick up again once things have settled down and go to four weeks total. So if they take a three week, uh, three, say they take a week break, they've had two weeks of treatment, take a week break. They've got another week of treatment to go to get to that four weeks. And then you need to follow it up. You need to see this three to six months later to make sure there's no clinical sign of recurrence. If it's come back, don't treat it again. This is a resistant squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, and there's a reason for that. And I'll show you it next. Um, this needs to be cut out, all right? That's no other option. If it fails treatment once, I don't treat it again, it gets cut out. Superficial BCC, a Micomod 5% Aldara. This one, licensed for use for superficial BCC. Um, you use it five days of the week, once a day to that spot and half a centimeter of normal, normal surrounding skin. So I say put it on Monday to Friday for six weeks. Again, if it gets really tender, take a break, include that in your six weeks and then pick up where you left off. A mod has a high failure rate on the face because of that superficial BCC going down hair follicles and the cream can't get there. Uh, and on lower limbs because your immune system is not great below the knee. Um, and uh, that's what it's relying on. It's designed to stimulate your immune system to come kill the BCC. So if that's not you know, there and really working, then you get a poor, recur um, poor treatment rate. Um, plus you run the risk sometimes of these things ulcerating and then they break down and then you end up with a non-healing ulcer. A mod at treating superficial BCCs is superior to Effudix, and again, both of those are superior to PDT. So PDT coming in last every time. Um, Effudix, not for superficial BCC. If you're gonna treat a superficial BCC, use a mod. all right? A number of times I've got patients who've come in who've used Effudix on their superficial BCC under guidance from their doctor. Um, it's not the right treatment and we don't do it. So why does it fail? Well, here is a squamous cell carcinoma in situ with adnexal extension. So if you ever get a biopsy report back, sometimes the pathologists comment on it. It's generally on the face where you see this because of the large number of terminal hairs. Um, and they might say squamous cell carcinoma in situ with adnexal extension. If you see that, it needs to be cut out. It's going to fail nine times out of 10 because this, the, you can see here that these cells, yes, they're up here, but they're also crawling down this hair follicle. And same here, here you've got tumor cells sitting in this hair follicle um, and here crawling down here, this is all SCCIS. And so your cream can't get there, it's never gonna work. You'll treat the surface, it'll look great and then it's just gonna crawl back and come back on you. And eventually if you keep treating it over years, it might become an SCC and become invasive and you've driven it underground and you don't know how deep it's gone before it starts coming back up to the surface. So if it fails once, it gets cut out. Superficial BCC, same thing. Um, these guys, whilst they're called superficial, can sometimes be deeper, and they like to, again, go down in nexal structures, be a little bit thicker, even though this hasn't broached the basement membrane. Um, these guys can be tricky. And if you, you know, superficial BCCs are nasty little buggers. Some of our worst cancers that we've had in terms of, you know, cutting them out on someone's face and keep going and going and going, I've got a photo on the wall that I could show later if we have time, um, is of a superficial BCC that's been treated recurrently. And what happens is part of it responds and part of it doesn't. And you end up with these then multifocal bits all over the place that then take off and keep doing their own thing. So you get skip lesions, normal skin, BCC, normal skin, BCC. And you just have to keep going until you clear it. And even then you can't have any certainty that you've cleared it because if you happen to cut through the normal bit of skin, when you've missed the bit that's, you know, a centimeter outside of that, you're never gonna know about it. So, you know, these guys, again, they fail treatment once, that's it, they get excised. The other reason that topical treatment fails with the BCC is frequently these little buggers have um, mixed histology. So you can see, you know, this guy up here, superficial disease up here and nodular, all right? If you just biopsied and happened to get the superficial component, you'd think, great, it's a superficial BCC, no fault of your own. This is, you know, it happens. This is sampling error as a result of biopsy. You can't take the whole lesion, you're taking a small bit. And if you happen to get the bit that's just the superficial BCC, well, there you go. 
you've done topical treatment, it's failed. Maybe it's mixed histology, it needs to be cut out. Same thing here. This guy, superficial BCC going down the ignexal structures and becoming micronodular um, in this component here. And this one, a real mix. You've got some superficial BCC up here. You've got some micronodular BCC over here. And you've got some infiltrative uh, BCC heading down this way. So, you know, it, they can have multiple appearances and multiple histological subtypes. And it's not uncommon that we see mixed histology within the one tumor. So surgery. So, you know, when do I operate? Well, every single squamous cell carcinoma gets cut out. Um, even the microinvasive ones. So you might get a report that says microinvasive and you think, oh, that's great. You know, it's microinvasive. We'll put some topical on it. No. Microinvasive, all of, there's no agreed definition on how thick you know, into the dermis is a microinvasive before you call it a non-microinvasive and just a normal ACC. Um, but these guys, you know, they're not SCC in situ. They've broken through the basement membrane. So they are already thicker than an SCCIS. So they have to be cut out. Um, otherwise, they will become recurrent. All non-superficial BCCs, um, I never use a topical treatment on them because they have a very high failure rate if you're treating anything but a superficial BCC. Superficial BCC on the face, uh, we will generally excise, and that's because you know we've we do most surgery, right? So we can see around the tumor, know we get it out, um, and then we can fix it up any hole that we make because that's what we do. Um, so we have every confidence in excising these things, but you could try Aldara on the face, but you need to follow them up closely. And if it recurs after a single treatment, send that person for surgery. Don't do them the disservice of treating it again or ignoring it because it's going to become a massive nightmare in years to come. Lower limb, I've already chatted about. Um, and that's what I've said, you know, cosmesis and body lesions, you know, you've, in, in different areas, body locations, not body lesions, sorry, it's a typo. Um, like I said, you know, if there's a BCC and you don't want a white scar, you, then you cut it out instead. Any squamous cell carcinoma with adnexal extension um, and anything that's failed topical treatment, as I've said, which I know I've harped on about a little bit, but because I do feel rather strongly about it. Um, so there's, these are the instances when I operate. So what are the options for surgery? You've got cryosurgery, you've got wide local excision, the standard excision. Um, be that elliptical or you're going to repair it with a flap afterwards and margin controlled excision. So that's Mohs micrographic surgery named after Frederick Mohs who developed the technique back in the 50s and has now become the gold standard um, in the literature for treating skin cancers, um, you know, mainly squamous cell, basal cell, uh, but a wide range of non melanoma skin cancers on the head and the neck and in other special sites. So genitals, um, hands, low legs, tops of feet, that sort of area will do Mohs surgery on. So, you know, cryosurgery, we're going to come back to this. Let's just give it a light freeze. We're going to end up with this poor chap here um, and a number of recurrent tumors because we're not freezing them properly. So this is a chap who I saw on Thursday last week and I asked him if I could take photos knowing I was giving this talk and he very kindly agreed. So you can do cryosurgery for any confirmed superficial BCC or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Now, do I go and biopsy every lesion that I feel is a superficial BCC on a back? No. Clinically, if I'm confident that I can't see any raised component to the lesion, clinically it fits with the BCC and dermoscopically it has features of a BCC. And when I feel it through the skin and I sort of roll the skin between my fingers, I'm unable to feel any thickness to the lesion directly underneath it, so no induration. I'm then happy clinically to call it a superficial BCC off the face and I will then freeze it. Um, and then we follow it up. Right, um, and I'm yet in the two years touch wood to have a recurrence of these guys, so that's good. It will happen to me at some point though. Uh, same with squamous cell carcinoma in situ. These are generally ones that you can have biopsy confirmed because sometimes it's hard to know what's a hypertrophic actinic keratosis, what's a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, what's an early SCC. So if I've got a biopsy confirmed SCCIS, I'll then talk to the patient about whether they want epidex surgery or cryosurgery, listing the pros and cons of each. Um, if they don't want surgery, I then make sure we follow it up that it's been treated. How do I do it? Well, I do a single freeze-thaw cycle with marked four millimeter margins. So I don't guess my margins. You can actually see the pen marks here that I've done. That's one there. That's one there. That's one there. That's one there. Marked at four millimeters all the way around the lesion. And then I draw my circle around that. So I know that when I freeze to the outside of that line, I have four millimeters around my tumor. And the way that you do it, you don't have to do a double freeze thaw cycle. You can do a single freeze thaw cycle as long as you first establish your ice field. So what do I mean by that? You get your ice ball all the way out to the edges before you start counting. 
So this doesn't count. This is just getting it there. And I do all of this under superficial local anesthetics. So my nurse will inject it superficially under these to make it more comfortable for the patient. Once I've established this ice field, then I start the clock on my, on my clock, on my phone. I hit 30 second, off we go. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm freezing enough to maintain this ice field. So initially you're freezing it quite a bit, you know, ch -ch 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 kind of business. And then as that ice ball is getting thicker and thicker and um, more established, you then slow that down just so you maintain that ice ball right out to the 30 seconds. And what the literature says is that you should aim to have that ice field remain for at least 60 seconds. So that means if you stop treating 60 seconds later, it should still be thawing out. Um, if it thaws out before that, you haven't done it enough, go back and freeze it again, because that's the right way to treat it. You know, do I wait for 60 seconds? No, because I know when I've free, free, frozen it like this, I also feel it before, between my fingers and I've kind of done it enough now where I gauge them about three or four millimeters down to the dermis and I'm happy, but that's you know something that I've established over the years um, to know that I'm happy to treat these things that way. But if, if you're new to it, if you're doing it and you want to be certain, just check you know that it's still a bit frozen in the middle there after 60 seconds. So with cryosurgery, I never do it on the face because I'm always going to leave a scar. You know, if you're freezing this like a cancer on the nose, if you're going deep enough, you're going to hit cartilage, you're going to leave a big disfiguring scar. So why would you ever do it? You wouldn't do it to yourself. Um, and if you're going to give it a light freeze, well, don't bother, right? Because you know you're treating a skin cancer. Um, careful below the knee. I don't, I never use it below the knee. I, you know, it doesn't matter the age of the person because you know, then they've either got to keep their leg up while this is healing, which is impossible, or they're going to have an ulcer for three to six months. You got to be sure of your diagnosis. And I think I've gone on enough about that. Um, four millimeter margins are essential. That's where the literature is um, to make sure you're getting round and under it um, and you know, encapsulating the whole tumor the first time and make sure that you time it. You know, it's very easy to think you've done 30 seconds, but actually it's been 20 or you know, 40. Um, so you know, set the clock, do it by the time, do it by the clock. So you know, this is our chap with the um, recurrent BCCs on his uh, back, you know, the superficial ones. So this is a chap who, you know, I said we'd come back to, to talk about wide local excision and why incomplete excision should be avoided. There are lots of examples, but, you know, this was the guy that sprang to mind. So this chap, you can see he's got a skin graft here. He's actually got a recurrent BCC that we dealt with uh, there, actually. Sorry, this biopsy just on the side there within the skin graft underneath it, because that was incompletely excised at the deep margin. This was at the periphery. Uh, so he's got normal skin above and skin graft running through the middle of it. He had this recurrent BCC from an incompletely excised BCC. You know, if you're talking about incomplete excision and why we should be avoiding it, um, you know, especially on the face, because it always results in greater tissue loss. You know, what we've done here, and I'll show you the photo later of, of what we did with this chap, but we had to go down deep and we've stripped off periosteum. So that's exposed bone down the bottom there of this defect. It's quite a deep defect. The photo doesn't do it justice. The problem with that is I can't graft that. I cannot put a graft onto exposed bone. It won't take, you need periosteum or tissue above it. So then you end up having to do these other fancier things to reline these defects so that we can just pop a graft onto this for this chap because he didn't want anything else. And quite honestly, there wasn't really anything else we could do besides a graft because his skin was tight as a drum and it wouldn't move. Um, so graft was the only option here for him, unfortunately. Squamous cell carcinoma, you know, if you're incompletely excising these things, if you get a recurrent squamous cell carcinoma after it's been incompletely excised, you've got a 30% chance um, that you can get another recurrent SCC. Uh, and of those, a third of them will become metastatic to local lymph nodes. So once you've incompletely excised an SCC, if you're not dealing with it properly, uh, you run the risk of this causing um, mortality uh, and serious morbidity. You know, about a third of patients who have um, lymph node metastatic SCC will die. Um, and we've seen it. I've got a couple of patients who are currently in that boat. You are aiming to cure the cancer. Like every other cancer, you are aiming to cure it. So do it once, do it properly, get it out. And that's why our excision margins are vital because that ensures we have the greatest chance of getting it out the first time. So this is what we did. Just to show you out of interest sake, we elevated this flap of skin, exposed his um, Temporalis, the muscle, uh, freed up. This temporalis was lying above under that piece of skin, freed it up, lifted it, swung it down on this hinge uh, and sutured it down over this exposed bit of bone, put this bit of skin back over the top and stitched it in. And then we could put a graft over the top of that. So it's a lot more work. It's a lot more recovery for the patient. You're having bigger excisions, you're having bigger um, procedures. 
um, and you know it's potentially avoided if you exercise it properly the first time. So look, you know it's not all the time. You're not going to get it right every time. The evidence is that you know if you do your standard margins, about 95% of the time you'll get it out. So you you are going to face tumors despite your best intentions, where you're going to get an incomplete excision. Um, but as long as you're doing the right thing by your patient and following the evidence and the guidelines, that's the best that we can do and we can hope for. So a note on incomplete excisions. I always orientate my specimens. Um, I'll either do, well, I'll generally do a blunt end. So in my lips, I'll cut one end off outside of my four millimeter marked margin on the skin. I'll blunt one end, say that's superior or medial or whatever. You can put a suture through that, but you can put a notch in that end as long as there's something you know and the lab knows where 12 o'clock is, three o'clock, nine o'clock. So if you get back that, you know, your three o'clock peripheral margin was positive, you know exactly where you're going. If your deep margin is positive, then you have to recreate the original defect and then add your clinical margin. So I'm going to try and explain this in graphical format because that's quite hard to understand. Um, so this is your tumor. You've added on your standard margin and you've cut it out as an ellipse. Now, obviously, an ellipse has pointed ends. These are my <laughs> limited abilities of drawing in PowerPoint. But you take out the ellipse. You then stitch together and you get the pathology report back saying, hey, actually, sorry, your deep margin is positive. So you've cut through your tumor at the bottom. So some people, what they'll do, and my, the way I used to think about it before I was taught, um, is, well, I'll just go and add on another four millimeters around that. And I'll take that right down to the deep margin, right? And I'll make sure that I get it out. And then I'll have cleared the cancer. Actually, I haven't, because all I've done is I've then cut with those four millimeter margins through my deep margin, because the original tumor possibly extended out beyond that. And all I've done is made the deep margin smaller, but it's still positive. And now I've done a second excision uh, and I still have an incompletely excised tumor. Um, and now we're starting to get into territory where you're going for the third re-excision. What were your original margins? What was the original tumor size? How much more do you need to take? So you're starting to get into dodgy area um, and you know, you're almost hunting in the dark. So what's the other way you can approach it if you get a deep margin positive? you redraw your original defect. So if you knew that your original cancer was one centimeter, mark out one centimeter in the center of your scar where you know the tumor originally was, draw that in because that is your positive deep margin that you've drawn, then add on your clinical margin around that. And then you can go and excise that again as a standard ellipse. So it's the same size as your original excision, then stitch it up. Um, so as long as you're then getting that deep margin out, there's a good chance that you're gonna fully encapsulate that. If you're still getting a positive margin after that, it's a nasty tumor, right? Um, then it needs to be sent off to, to people who can specialize in that stuff, um, who spend all day looking down microscopes like we do to make sure we get these things out for you. Um, so wide local excision of squamous cell carcinoma. Well, it comes down to whether the lesion is high risk or low risk that will dictate your clinical margins. Those high risk features again, is it bigger than two centimeters off the face? If it's on the face, you know, then it is automatically a high risk. So if it's on the hand or the feet, uh, anogenital SCC, they're all high risk. Um, mucosal SCC, even squamous cell carcinoma in situ on the lip, that gets cut out every time. If it's recurrent or if it has poorly defined margins, you know, who the hell knows where this thing starts and stops. Um, that's a high risk tumor. Is the patient immunosuppressed? So your organ transplants in particular are at risk. Pull differentiated greater than six millimeters through the skin or Clark level five, it's down through the fat, or if it has perineural or lymphovascular invasion. You know, these are all high risk features. For high risk tumors, you need at least a six millimeter clinical margin drawn around your tumor. And I'll show you how I mark them up. Um, I was actually thinking today when I did an excision that I should have drawn it on the patient taken photos, but I didn't think so. I apologize. I don't have a real life example for you. Um, Generally, what I do, if I can, is I actually do about a you know six mil to one centimeter wide local excision um, when we're talking off the face. So if I'm on a leg and cutting off an SCC, you know if it's a big SCC and it's high risk, it's going to need a graft. So why would I skimp on my margins if I'm already doing a graft? Um, so I may as well add on one centimeter all the way around the bugger, take it right down to fascia, get it out, and slap a graft on it. All right. Um, if it's a low risk one though, you can do four to five uh, millimeter clinical margins, never lower than that for an SCC. Like I said, I don't guess my margins every single time I measure them. Wide local excision for a BCC. The evidence does, there is evidence around these small well-defined nodular BCCs that you can get away with three millimeter clinical margins. 
um, might be okay. I mean, I don't, I don't, I st stick with formula mean margins because that's where the evidence says you get a greater than 95% clearance. Uh, and I also keep in mind that these things can have mixed histology. So whilst tip of the iceberg might look like a nice, you know, well-defined nodular tumor, maybe you've got something more underlying it or just out to the side of it um, that you risk, you know, undercutting um, if you don't stick with your standard margins. So I know a millimeter doesn't sound like a lot, but it can make the world of difference with these things sometimes. Um, so I stick with four millimeter margins and run with that. However, if it has high risk pathology, so if it's a micronodular tumor, an infiltrative tumor, a desmoplastic tumor, um, then they get a five to 10 millimeter wide local excision margin. Um, or ideally, they get most micrographic surgery to ensure that we're dealing with those guys first time. Now, not every patient can afford it. Um, you know, Mohs is not cheap because it's very labor intensive and I make no qualms about that. Um, and plus, you know, we're, we're repairing these things and most Mohs surgeons, we pride ourselves on our cosmetic outcome as well, right? So we're, and we stand by our work. Um, so we're aiming to get the best repair possible. And I've got some examples later on um, of nasty recurrent tumors and them getting fixed up in the holes that were made. But, you know, for standard things off the face, five to 10 millimeter wide local excision, if you know you've got an infiltrative or a micronodular, because if it's on the back, it doesn't matter. If it's on the thigh, there's skin to move. So why wouldn't you just do it the first time? Um, don't skimp on your margins, please. So how I mark it, this is how I wish I'd taken photos today, but that's my tumor. I measure out all four quadrants. Uh, if it's a small tumor, I'll then measure four millimeters, put a line, four millimeters, put a line, four, four, right, all the way around. Uh, then I'll draw my circle around it, and then the ellipse goes around that. Right, so that's how I do it. This is obviously from bird's eye view. Um, that's how I draw my margins. If it's a funny shape, you know, sometimes these tumors have like a bit missing out of them. I'll draw my four millimeters from the edge of the tumor after I've drawn around the tumor. I'll measure four millimeters, but I don't then might make my excision a funny shape to match that funny shape of the tumor. I just extend the clinical margin I'm taking around that site to make it a circle to match the rest of the margin around. Um, so, you know, don't think, oh, I've got to you know, bring this edge in here because this tumor is a funny shape. Like, don't bother. Just make your circle round all the way. As long as you're not going in on your four millimeter margin, you're fine. If you're outside it, great. You've got even greater clearance. So why most surgery? Well, you know, I'm a bit biased because it's what I do all day. Um, and I know why it works and how it works. But I think in order to understand Mohs, you need to understand how the lab for a standard excision processes it. They do something called bread loafing. So this is your tumor. They'll take representative samples. They'll take more than three, but they'll take representative samples through the block. And they'll then take, you know, a bit and analyze it under the microscope and say, hey, look, you know, your tumor's all clear. You've got it out all around the periphery and at the deep, job done. There's nothing above and below. Well done. You're a great surgeon. It's out. But if they haven't sampled the bit where the skin cancer is still sitting subclinically, right, you can't see it, but it's still there, you're never going to know about it. And that is why wide local excision has failure rates associated with it. And that's why four millimeters and greater uh, gets you your 95% clearance. How did they establish these margins? It was done using Mohs surgery. So what they did was they draw a round lesion, they would take it out, with, say a one millimeter margin, look at it under the microscope and go, there's still tumor. They'd then take another millimeter around where they'd done that, take that out as a little ring of skin, look again and go, there's tumor. And they would keep doing that every millimeter. And when they got out to four millimeters and then they got out to five millimeters, they found that 95% of the time or greater, the tumor was gone. So, you know, Mohs was used to establish these guidelines on how we should be treating them. Um, and that's why margin assessment is so important. Um, so, you know, they've taken representative samples. So, you know, just have a think in your head, what percentage of the surgical margin is assessed by the bread loaf technique? You know, do you think it's less than 2%? Um, is it about 10%, 25, 67, um, or 100% of the margin, right? So you've got a number in your head. The answer is actually less than 2%. So depending on the size of the specimen, the lab will analyze 0.1 to 1% of the true surgical margin. So that's nothing. Absolutely nothing. If they did every single bit, they would be looking at that one slide for, you know, five days straight um, because there'd be so many specimens. So, you know, this is kind of a scary thing to think about. This applies with melanoma excisions and all the rest of it. They're only looking at less than 2% of your true surgical margin. So you need to clinically make sure you're doing the best you possibly can to get around that tumor so that the pathologist has the greatest chance of reporting it clear and everyone's happy. So one thing um, to be aware of is also, well, I can't spell apparently, pathology. 
Um, beware the close histological margin. So, you know, I've got a chap at the moment in Rotorua. I see him for his psoriasis. Um, when I do my public list, but I saw a lump on his head and, you know, it's hard to look past it. Um, and it turns out he had an SCC excise from about 10 months prior. The histology report came back showing uh, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, um, 0 0.2 millimeters clear at the deep margin. Uh, excision appears to be complete with a close deep margin was the comment in the report. The surgeon saw it, didn't quite understand the whole processing side of things, obviously, said to him it's all gone. Uh, and now he's got recurrent and metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. It's in his left neck. It was in four out of the 40 lymph nodes with extra capillary extension through the lymph nodes in his neck and it's in his left parotid. Um, so, you know, you need to understand these pathology reports and the limitations of what the pathologist is seeing. And again, that's through that bread loafing technique. If they're seeing a close, deep or peripheral margin, there is a higher chance that they've got tumor still sitting there in the patient, that you've got tumor still sitting in the patient. Um, so, you know, if I'm getting reports, you know, like an SCC, uh, and, you know, it's less than one millimeter away from um, my peripheral or my deep margin, I'm always thinking, actually, maybe I should re-excise this lesion, or at least I'm going to follow this patient up very closely, uh, you know, four to six weeks time to have a look, and I might see them again, you know, a couple of months after that, and I warn the patient about the pathology report and what it means, and that if they notice anything, that they get in touch with me. So, you know, I always, you know, err on the side of caution with these things because I see the worst of it. So don't get fooled by a narrow excision margin thinking that it's all out because there is a chance that you haven't fully excised this lesion, particularly in your high risk SCCs. You know, if you've got a moderate or poorly differentiated lesion that was big, um, poorly defined clinical margins, you know, the patient's immunosuppressed or, you know, it's got perineural invasion and you've got a close deep margin, that has to go for a re-excision. Don't mess around with it. Even if the, the subsequent re-excision shows scar only, the lab might not have sectioned the bit of that original excision scar that's still got the tumor in it. Because again, they're only looking at about 1% of the whole margin. So if it only shows scar, don't worry, you've done the best thing for your patient. You can reassure them that you've done a wide repeat local excision to get around it and there's no residual evidence of tumor. Um, and that is a very safe clinical decision to make. Um, and I would stand by you, you know, if you did that, I'd stand by you till the cows come home really on that front. Um, or ideally, if it's on the face or if it's, you know, a big one on the leg or hand or anything, we do Mohs surgery on it. So what is Mohs? For those of you who don't know, Mohs doesn't stand for anything, right? So like I said, it's named after Frederick Mohs. Um, so that was his surname. Um, but it's Mohs micrographic su um, surgery. We use the microscope. I've got it sitting here right on my right hand side. Basically what it is, is clinically we mark around the tumor on the skin that we can see and we'll take it out with down to a suitable depth. Generally, we'll go down through fat to make sure we get around the whole tumor um, or down to cartilage or down to periosteum uh, to make sure we're getting it around it um, first time. Then we put a patch on it, the patient waits in our waiting room. Uh, so they turn up at 7.30 in the morning um, and it might be an all day affair. Um, you know, if we've got big nasty tumors or it's a busy day, sometimes patients leave us at six, seven o'clock, but at least they know at the end of the day, knowing we've got all the tumor out and we've repaired it in the best way possible to the best of our abilities. Um, but basically, you know, that's that specimen gets turned into perfect slides um, by our Mohs techs. We look at it under the microscope and what we're looking at um, is the margin, the whole surgical margin all the way around and at the underneath bit. Um, the way that we do it, we do something called on fast. So the tumor sits there looking at us. It doesn't get bread loaf that way. It sits um, on the chuck in the cryostat where they slice it. And we take slices through it from the bottom. And the way that we lay these things up is we put these skin edges down. So you see the skin edge when it gets cut right through and through the deep margin. You don't have to understand the technicality of it too much, but it allows us to see the whole edge of the tumor. If we don't see the whole edge of our tumor, we either take more or we get our text to slice us, to take us more slices until we know we've seen all around. If you see tumor still remaining, you go and take a little bit more, make sure that's out. If there's still some tumor, you go and take a little bit more until it's all clear. All right? So that's what Mohs surgery is. It's using the microscope to guide you. And you know, Mohs surgery has cure rates of over 99.7% in the literature. Um, so, you know, it is the gold standard. Yes, it's not 100%, nothing is, um, but it is the absolute gold standard and it's what you would all want if you've got a skin cancer on your face. So if your patient's able to have it, if they're lucky enough to live in a region that has it in the public system, which really is only Auckland at Auckland Hospital, 
um, then it is the one to be sending patients for. Now, please don't go all rush and send them into Auckland Hospital for most surgery because it is for very select tumors, nasty recurrent or for big things. Those are the ones that make it onto the public list. Um, but if your patient has insurance, you know, then I would definitely be sending them for most surgery. So, you know, with most technique, what percentage of the surgical margin is assessed? Uh, those same numbers as before. And as I said, it's 100%. We're looking at the entire edge and at the underneath, at the deep margin to make sure it's all out. And we're chasing that tumor until we know we've got it all clear. So here are some examples. Here's a small one um, on a chap's ala. This was a little modular BCC there for him. Um, and when we fix it up, like I said, we're aiming to restore normality. Um, so you might think, holy hell, you've sliced down through the rim of his nose there. And indeed we have, we went full thickness and closed it up. Um, but it gets us the best result. And that's what he looks like uh, six weeks post-op. So yes, it's a little bit red because he's only six weeks post-op, but he's got a normal arc of his um, ala um, and of his uh, nasal aperture. Um, and this redness all settled down. And he's quite stoked with the result as are we. Uh, bigger tumors on lips, you know, you make a big hole. This is for a squamous cell carcinoma on a lip. Uh, this required three stages to get it clear. Luckily, it wasn't too deep, so you've still got a bit of a bicularis oris sitting in there, the muscle band around on the lip. Um, we closed him up, um, and he was quite happy with his result afterwards as we have advanced the vermilion forward um, and closed up the cutaneous lip underneath it. This chap, um, so this guy had a big nasty tumor here at his left temple. Um, it was very tight to get it closed, so we had to mobilize part of his cheek. Uh, and then do these relaxing incisions here, what's known as a bridge flap, to get the rest of it closed. Um, we got it all closed. As you can tell, he was a bleeder, which made my life fun that afternoon. Um, so he had a drain in, uh, but he was very happy with his end result. Um, and this was him, uh, this is three months post-op. Initially, he had a bit of palsy of the facial nerve and couldn't elevate his eyebrow, but now three months out, he can lift it again. And that's just because this flap and the swelling went right over where his facial nerve sits to elevate his brow. Uh, but he was happy. Yes, you can see the scar line um, because he's formed an angiectasia around it. Um, but this will fade over time. Um, and he was quite happy with the result. This chap. So this, um, he had, this is a BCC on his nose. And you see all this damage up here. Is it part of the tumor, isn't it? Um, he'd had this treated with Aldara and then Ifidex about four times in total. Um, and unsurprisingly, it didn't work. So he ended up having the whole tip of his nose removed up into his nasal dorsum. And what you can't quite appreciate here is it went down onto the nasal sidewall and part of his right ala. Um, so we then had to repair all that and it was a composite repair. We used his cheek to repair side of the nose. We used this bit of skin that was redundant with remobilizing the cheek to do a full thickness skin graft on, the, um, on his ala. And we did what known as a forehead flap, which is this beast here, where this tip of the nose that's now been sutured in, this used to be the top of his forehead sitting where you can see the scar that was sitting up there, gets swung down on a pedicle, getting its vascular supply from the supertrochlear artery, um, gets plumbed in there, sits there for three to four weeks. Then we go and we divide it. Um, at three to four weeks, we remove that finger of skin, set all that in to get it looking right, um, and then sculpt all that to reform his nose like we did here. So yes, there's a slight color mismatch that's going on, but he's got excellent symmetry um, for what was a very complex repair. Um, and he's quite happy with the result. And you can see this forehead scar extends right down here. Um, but again, you know, he's not uh, too bothered by that. Um, and we're very happy to have repaired such a large defect. Curatage and cautery, you might ask about, you know, you can correct lesions, but they need to be the right lesion. They need to be superficial. You, you can't go and curate a nodular tumor or an infiltrative tumor because where do you start at the stop? You're not going to know your margins. And I always send these for histology, but they're not going to tell you your margins because you've scraped it. And it's in several pieces all floating around in formalin. Um, again, four millimeter margins, that's what's needed. You're treating a cancer. Um, select cases only, not on the face. You might do it, you know, in someone who's elderly and infirm um, and, you know, he might scrape it off their back or on their leg um, and deal with it. It's very rare that I do curatage. Um, when you do it, you go right out to your four millimeter margins. You're scraping down, making sure you're getting through the tumor down to deep dermis. Um, you'll then do electrodesication, you'll cauterize that whole boom bed in between, then you'll turn your correct 90 degrees and you'll go again across the lesion and you'll um, cauterize that again. So that's the way, if you're going to treat a superficial cancer with curatin cautery, that's the way to do it. Um, the cautery is an important step because it is also mopping up some residual tumor as well as stopping the bleeding. But it's very rare that we do it. 
non-surgical options, you can send patients for radiotherapy. Um, they're pretty swanky, pretty cool machines and suites that they go into, but it's never fun for the reason that you're going there. Uh, really, radiotherapy is reserved for inoperable or inaccessible tumors, but it's quite rare that we hit an inoperable tumor. Yeah, most people can tolerate local anesthetic just fine, and we do everything under local anesthetic. Maybe some light sedation to get a lorazepam if they're particularly nervous. But that whole forehead flap that you saw with that um, complex repair, he did it all under local anesthetic. Um, they're knackered afterwards, but it's much safer than general. Um, so, you know, it's rare that we don't get, that we get an inoperable tumor. But sometimes, you know, if it's inaccessible, in other words, we've chased this tumor down to a foramen, you know, within the maxilla or on the, you know, anywhere on, on the skull, um, and we can't get to that nerve anymore, and the max fax surgeons can't get to it when we send them off, these patients will get radiotherapy even if they can get to it because it's tracked down the nerve, it's a very high risk tumor, they'll have it as adjuvant treatment. And if we're seeing perineural invasion within the small nerves on the skin, we'll often send patients for low dose adjuvant radiotherapy because they're high risk tumors. So, you know, quite commonly we keep um, the radio oncologists busy with our tumors. Um, but if it's someone is particularly frail and you really think, you know, this person has a BCC um, on their face or whatever, and they're really not going, they're not, going to cope at all with having something cut out, whatever, you can send them for radiotherapy. You know, basal cell carcinomas, the vast majority of them are quite radiosensitive. Um, you don't know if you've treated it. You don't know your clinical margins. Um, you don't know if the radio oncologist gets around the whole thing. But that's, you know, that is one of the uncertainties you're dealing with with um, radiotherapy, but it is an option. If you really think someone's not a surgical candidate, then send them to the radio oncologists um, for their opinion. Uh, they're always happy to see an advice. Right, so I've zoomed through that. Uh, we've just, I went slightly longer than I wanted to, but I think we've got time for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was a very thorough and clear presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions coming through. Um, one is in terms of doing three millimeter biopsies on their face. Is there anywhere we could kind of damage nerves? If we're just checking a quick three mil in there. I mean, look. I've only damaged one patient's nerve with an eight millimeter punch biopsy on their neck, all right? Um, I've never injured a nerve with a three mil. Uh, you might hit a small cutaneous nerve. They'll get a little bit of numbness in that area for a short period of time, um, but it's not, you're not gonna hit a major nerve because all you're doing with a biopsy is you're going down and lifting the skin up a bit around it. Um, once you feel it down through the dermis and the blood starts welling up around your biopsy, you know you're deep enough, you're through the dermis. That's when the blood starts coming. Um, and it's at that point that you stop. So it's very, I've never damaged a nerve with a three mil punch. But, you know, you've got to be aware of danger zones, right? So, you know, facial nerve comes through here, sitting from your tragus up into your brow. So across that line, yes, you've also got the temporal artery, which you can hit. You just chuck a big suture through it and tie it off. Um, sounds scary. The first time I did it, I decorated the room, but it was fine. Um, you can theoretically hit the facial nerve in that area. So that's why elevating the skin up so that you're not going down through the fascia and just going deep enough until you're in the subcut tissue, you're absolutely fine. Um, with older people that have some damage over quite an extensive area, how do we decide which bits to biopsy? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the bane of my existence. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Um, look, it is challenging. All right? I'm not going to lie, and it, it stumps us at times. The ones that you know, the ones you target, you, know, you see these people for the first time and they're covered, and you think, "Holy hell, what am I going to do?" Don't get overwhelmed. What you do is you have a look and you see which ones are bothering the patient because patients know which ones are tender or which ones are growing. Um, and those are the ones that you're going to think, right, I'm going to get those ones first. Then you might have a look and go, well, look, there's a large amount of them, but this one's thicker. And this one, if I feel it and roll it between my fingers, it feels like there's thickness under the skin. So that's more than just actinic keratosis, which you shouldn't really feel under any induration. So actually I'm going to target that one. And then, you know, once you've worked through those and you still don't really know, that's when you do a field treatment, right? So that's when, you know, come April to September out of, um, actually all my scripts have just gone out to my patients, um, out of summer, you'll send out your script for your field treatment. They'll do it. Don't be mean for the first time. Someone's done nephew please don't get them to do it over their entire face when they're covered in skin damage. It's a nightmare. Um, you're going to be backpedaling and giving them steroids and coaching them through it. So I, like I said, I break the face up into thirds. I'll do a temple through to temple and across the forehead, seven to 10 days combination treatment. Then once they've done that, they can start ears, cheeks, nose, cheeks, ear, right across there. And then they can do the lower half and upper lip 
um, and right across. So divide the face up for them, they'll like you more. Well, if someone's been doing epidics for years and they know what to do and there's not too much, yeah, hit the whole face. But, you know, not the first time you're seeing someone, they're not going to like you. A couple of questions around the cryotherapy. One, once you've done like your two circles, the initial and then the margins, you just hit with your cryo gun, you just hit it in the middle and that should spread out to your wider circle kind of thing. Yeah, yes and no, right? So for, for a smaller lesion, yeah, that's going to happen, right? You're going to freeze in the middle and it will freeze out to get that whole ice ball around the middle. But if it's bigger, generally, once you start getting over about a centimeter, centimeter and a half, you do, I always start in the middle and I'll freeze that. And once I've got that, then I slowly sort of spiral outwards um, with my cryo gun so that you start going out towards your circles in a spiral sort of fashion. Um, so I don't kind of go and then kind of jump all over the place. I spiral outwards so that I'm dragging that ice fuel outwards with me as I go until I get to my whatever I'm treating, whatever size it is. Um, by the way, if you're starting to treat something that big, cut it in half, right? Treat half of it with your margin, then bring the patient back in three months and treat the other half with the margin, okay? You can treat half and half of these things as long as you know in your photo what you've done and what half you've done and your margins to add. With the liquid nitrogen, do they really only need one treatment unless it's a quite large lesion that you need to cut in half? Yes. So I generally will only treat on, yeah, I'll only have to do one treatment for a superficial BCC unless it's big and I bring them back to treat the other half. Perfect. And the issue that we can see after the cryotherapy, would that apply to other lesions? Like if we're just removing a skin tag? No, because you're not freezing it for as long. You know, so if you're treating an actinic keratosis or if you're treating a skin tag and you give it a slight freeze, you warn your patients about the risk, but you're only freezing them like a SEBK, a separate keratosis as well. You're freezing them for five to 10 seconds mm. um, and just enough to tickle them off and cut off their blood supply if it's a skin tag. So the risk of causing a white scar there is lower. It's not zero, but, you know, if you're starting to cause a white scar, you've frozen it too much. Um, so you, you warn the patient that it's low risk, but you shouldn't be doing it if you're just treating those things. Okay. Um, topical treatments, how long do you usually follow the patient up for? Well, uh, I mean, you know, most of our patients keep seeing us, right? Because they're covered in skin cancer. Um, yeah. What I do is when I know that I'm seeing someone regularly and I've done topical treatment, I will follow them up on my nurse's list. I'll just pop in and see them three months after they finish treatment to make sure that there's no recurrence then. I then warn the patient, keep an eye out for any red scaly bits coming back in that area that you've treated and you let me know straight away. And then I will see them for their next skin check. You know, the people that we're doing this in, they see us once a year. Um, at the very least, some of them see us every four to six months. Um, so then I'll be able to follow it up with every time then. Um, but as long as you've warned the patient what to look out for, I find that patients are pretty good at, at letting you know if something's not quite right. Um, and with the topical treatments, do you tend to only use those after you've got like a clear histological diagnosis? Yes. Unless, you know, unless, like I said, if I... If I'm really confident with my clinical diagnosis of a BCC on the shoulder or on the back or on the arm or on the thigh and the patient doesn't mind a white scar, and remember that's where you can't see any raised rolled edges, it's just a pink area um, that has you know, micro erosions or little white crystalline structures or you know, the other features of BCC. And when you, you sort of feel it and you roll the skin around, you know, so you kind of like, I'll pick these things out and I'll kind of have a little feel. And if it feels thick under my finger, then I don't freeze it. If I just feels like the rest of the surrounding skin, then I'll freeze it without a biopsy. But a squamous cell carcinoma in situ always gets a biopsy because like I said, I can't tell the difference between a thick SCC in situ or a hypertrophic actinic keratosis or an early SCC. So they always get a biopsy and it's, it's a biopsy result that then dictates that treatment. There are a couple of comments about the funding restrictions and time restrictions in primary care in terms of wanting to do a biopsy, but um, not really your issue to thought but yeah just acknowledging that there there are a lot of a lot of problems I get it. You know, and I know that a lot of people are you know the you know I cover lakes DHB and I just do um medical dermatology for them every Friday but I was chatting with their CMO who's a general surgeon and um one of the the charge nurses about their surgical wait list so lakes DHB the old lakes DHB um has 400 lesions waiting on their lesion list um and these are ones that they're behind in so they are looking at ways to cope with this but a large number of them you know about a third are benign um which you know immediately removes them from the list having a biopsy result allows you to triage these things as a hospital system and 
you know, send your resources in a better direction than cutting out something that's benign or taking up a clinic room for something that's benign and just needs a biopsy. So yes, the DHBs are there for patients who can't afford these things or if there's time and funding restrictions. Um, but I would encourage you to teach your practice nurse to do a biopsy. I mean, all our nurses here in the practice, they do biopsies. A number of them were GP practice nurses, district nurses before they came here. It's the easiest thing. If I can teach a house officer to do a biopsy, you can definitely teach a nurse, right? Nurses are far more competent than a first year house. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's no reason why you can't upskill your nurse to do that biopsy in their own time on their list if they're able to. Um, Try and avoid, if you can, taxing the already taxed health system um, as much as you can. I mean, I do it as well. I try and avoid it as much as I possibly can. I manage things with telehealth as much as I can um, to at least if you're able to, if there's a possibility that even remote of getting that patient to agree to a biopsy, do it because you'll either find out if it's um, benign or malignant. And then that immediately gives the triaging physician on the other end the important information to be able to categorize that where it needs to go and how urgent does that need to be dealt with? Sure. Um, uh, the topical treatment, the combination with the Divinex and the Effudex, I think you mentioned you, they use quite a small amount of each cream. Did they get mix those together, they put one on then the other? Does it, did that matter the order? Doesn't matter the order. Um, you know, the initial studies, they put Effidex on, then they put Divinex on. What we do is patients will never be able to do that. Um, it's been hard enough to give you a bit of moisturizer if they got eczema. Um, so what you do is a half pea-sized amount will cover sort of temple, you know, one third of the face of each cream. So they put a half pea-sized amount of one, half pea-sized amount of the other on their finger, mix the two together, dot, 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 rub it in. OK, um, so the two get combined as part of that treatment and they get a very good, prompt, fast response. You don't need to do them separately, just mix them. Um, someone will wrap up soon, but someone had a question about I think just a pathology report. So why doesn't pathology call SCC in situ with a next link extension? How is that different from an invasive SCC? So it's whether or not it's, it's breached the basement membrane. So your basement membrane for your epidermis goes your epidermis, and then it follows the hair follicles and adnexal structures down, round, and back up the other side. So if an SCC has not gone through that basement membrane, which is a very important biological barrier to cancer, um, then even if it's down the hair follicle, it's still an SCCIS. It is still in situ. It has not gone through the basement membrane. Okay. All right. We've got another, we've got quite specific kind of questions here. Um, so we'll do a couple, a couple of extra minutes, but I know a lot of people don't have access to any dermatology advice um, where they are, so we'll just pick your brain now. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a few questions through about if um, AJ can repeat the advice around the topical therapy, but just a reminder that this uh, webinar will be available on our website from tomorrow, so if you've missed anything, it's all recorded and will be available tomorrow. Um, We've got one person who's 58, they've got a hyperpigmented lesion on their forehead, um, 0.5 by 0.7 centimeters, not changed with Effidex, has been treated twice, has mild texture change. What could it be? They're not keen for surgery. Is there any other way forward? Do we need to convince them and now need surgery? If, it, like, if it's hyperpigmented, you need to make sure you're not dealing with a melanoma, right? Mm -hmm. Or a pigmented BCC or a pigmented bonoid, um, you know, a pigmented SCC inside you. Um, so if it hasn't responded to Evidex and you've given it a go, biopsy the damn thing, right? Like that, that's really the only option there. If it's failed treatment and you're worried about it, get a tissue diagnosis. It's small enough where you can do a four millimeter punch biopsy and that is not surgery, right? That is a diagnostic procedure. So the patient's not having surgery, get a piece of it. Because if it's benign, then you don't have to worry about it. Then job done. But if it's malignant, if it's an lentigo malignant, then it needs to be sent off for surgery and the patient doesn't have a choice because they've got melanoma. Well, they've got a choice, but you know, who in their right mind is not going to get a melanoma excised? Yeah. Um, so, you know, please, please, please biopsy that lesion. Another quite specific one is someone's upheld um, treatment to bilateral dorsal forearms and someone with prolific AKs. They've had four weeks of Effudex and Divinex. If that doesn't work, what is their left, what, what could be their next option? I mean, look, you get them, not all of the lesions are going to respond, right? That's just the fact of it. If someone has that much actinic damage, they're not going to respond. You can enhance um, your ability to treat these by getting rid of the scale first. So either 10% urea cream used twice a day before you start your effidex treatment for two, three, four weeks, 
um, to get rid of that scale, which is gonna, it's like an insulator, right? It's not gonna let the creams penetrate before you start your Effidex. Some people will also put on vitamin A, so they'll put retrieve on to that area. After removing the scale, they'll then treat with retrieve um, for across that whole area, like a pea size, two pea size amount, you know, across the whole forearm um, for a week or two. And then they'll stop the retrieve and then they'll start the Effidex. So you've removed the scale, you've sort of primed the skin by thinning it out um, with the vitamin A, and then you hit it with the Effidex. So those are options that you can use, but it's more important actually just to chat to the patient and say, hey, look, we're not gonna clear them all, we'll get an improvement, but you know, this is years of sun damage that you're battling, you're not gonna get rid of everything. Also, if something's really not responding, you gotta ask yourself why, right? Is that actually more than just an actinic keratosis? So always keep that in, mind, in the back of your mind if it's not responding how you expect, biopsy it. Um, do you suture three millimeter punch biopsies? You don't have to. Um, if it's a three mil punch and it's off the central face, you know, if it's if it's on a lip, if it's on a nose, um, I would. Um, but if it's like on the side of your cheek there, or if it's up around the side of the forehead, um, in an area that's not immediately, you know, cosmetically sensitive, you can actually just pack these things with Keltostat. Um, so Keltostat, it's a cellulose product derived from seaweed. It forms a clot. You just shove it in pack it until it's full, put a little pressure dressing over the top, that will dissolve away on its own accord um, and it will just heal by secondary intent from the bottom up and they get great results. So you don't have to stitch it, no. And that's another cost-saving technique, right? Because if you're not doing a biopsy, you're not charging the patient for the thread, for the instruments, for the sterilization of that and the time that it takes to suture something. If it's on the nose though, if it's on the lip central face, please make sure you biopsy it. You get a much better cosmetic result. No one wants a hole in the middle of their nose. Finish up with one more question, which is any views on nicotinamide for heavily damaged skin? Yeah, look, nicotinamide, there's good evidence behind it. Um, so nicotinamide, the first one that was available in New Zealand was Blackmores in Solar, but there are now a whole bunch of them. Nicotinamide, niacinamide. Um, it is very good. We put our patients who have a lot of actinic damage onto it. Uh, it reduces your incidence of SCC and BCC by anywhere from 20 to 25%. So for patients who are getting a large amount of them, that's not an insignificant amount of surgery that they're gonna be skipping. Uh, it also helps reduce the amount of background damage that's there. Um, so nicotinamide, the dose always eludes me. I always have to remind myself because I get confused with melasma glutathione. It's either 250 or 500 milligrams twice a day. I can't remember, sorry, I need to look it up. Okay, thank you. We will finish up there. So just a big thank you again to AJ for taking the time to present this evening. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so have a lovely rest of your night, everyone. Thank you, Courtney.